the mortar that lasts for as long as 10,000 years. Brick by brick, China restores the largest man-made structure on Earth. The wall as we know it today is finally completed in approximately 1640. More than 300 years later, the wall's clay bricks have stood up to the elements. The very stamps pressed into the clay by brickmakers all across China can still be seen in the finished product. The wall stands as a testament to their skill and ingenuity. The Great Wall of China is still standing. It's made of brick and it's still standing. China employs brick to its full potential for protection. Across the world, another empire transforms it into a backbone of everyday life. Romans employ brick to erect stadiums, temples, and even bathhouses. Brick has a remarkable quality that it can, it can be used in incremental ways, so it can make an arch. The Romans were really the first to explore this. They were the first to really take it as an intellectual art. How far can we push this simple material? Way past adobe making, but to heroic architecture. Today, this structure still stands as a testament to the power of ancient Roman brick construction. Trajan's Market. Completed around 110 AD, the market has withstood the passage of time for one simple reason. The Romans' ability to employ brick's strengths and compensate for its weaknesses. You could say that under Trajan, that brick making in uh, the Roman world was at its apex. The design for the market calls for a six-story complex. This means the lower floors will bear incredible weight. In the ancient world, brick is the ideal material to support such mass. The brick strength is tremendous. You could stack brick 100, 200 feet tall. It will sustain the weight of itself. You could, you could stack uh, uh, six or eight cars on top of a single brick. It will not crush. The average Roman brick can sustain approximately 5,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. That's the equivalent of a hippopotamus pressing down on every single inch of it at once. Even modern concrete is only required to support two to 4,000 pounds per square inch. To further increase the brick's ability to sustain the load, the Romans turned to another architectural innovation, the arch. When we think of the Romans and what, how they contributed to brick construction, the, the first thing that comes to mind is the arch. The arch is essentially uh, a very perfect compression element. It's a very clever way to force brick, to force masonry to work in compression only. To create these arches, bricks are carved into wedges, then painstakingly shaped and sanded by hand to precise measurements in order to fit securely. Nearly 2,000 years later, you can still hardly fit a playing card between the bricks. But the greatest innovation in Trajan's market is a secret inside the walls. Roman bricks are not the same blocks used by the Chinese. Long and square, they resemble thick tile more than anything else. By cutting these bricks like a pizza into halves, quarters, or even eighths, Romans create a formula for incredibly stable walls. The outside of the wall is straight and flat, but this is just a facade. Behind it is another material that gives it even greater strength concrete. They've used this face brick arches and, and stacked brick and then they would uh, fill the inside of the walls with concrete or grout. The jagged sharp edges of the brick triangles bond perfectly with the concrete. So each each little bit of concrete had a place to put his thumb and forefinger so it gave it a mechanical retention as well as just an adhesive retention. It's just Good engineering. What this did, in essence, is create comp a composite wall, brick and concrete, and, uh, and, it, and they gained more strength still. Brick's compressive strength combined with the use of concrete allows Trajan's market to become an ancient high-rise.
In Rome, brick proves that it can withstand the onslaught of time. More than a thousand years later, this material will help create a new center of Europe and display a prized trait to the world. Now, go back inside the science of brick. London, England. This legendary city turns to brick to overcome one of the greatest disasters in its history. In the process, London redefines how this material will be made and used. September 2nd, 1666. Flames engulf London. Over three days, the losses are staggering. 13,000 houses, 87 churches, and countless businesses. The city lies in ashes. As Londoners clean up the wreckage, they notice something amazing. The flames that rage through the city stop right here. This is part of the ancient city wall. It is made of brick, and it is entirely unharmed by the flames. In fact, seemingly every time the fire reaches a brick wall, it stops in its tracks. The reason? Brick is fireproof. When clay is fired in a kiln, the particles inside fuse together into a new molecular structure. The result is a rock-hard substance that will not melt unless it is pushed to more than 2,000 degrees. In essence, brick is virtually immune to typical fires. It's already been fired in a furnace for days before you ever get to use it. So its properties were actually gained by its thermal sintering of the components together. And so you come along and heat it back up to the kind of temperatures of a kiln, which not, would not be uncommon in a fire. It sort of says, oh, back in the kiln. In the wake of the London fire, Christopher Wren, the chief builder to the king, imposes new regulations on all reconstruction. Every new building must be made from fireproof materials. London turns to brick. People wanted to use fireproof products that could withstand any kind of catastrophe that, that would come around. But the city also needs to build quickly. Brick construction is incredibly time consuming. From the earliest brick structures up to the modern day, each building has gone up the same way. Brick by brick, each one painstakingly laid by hand. Typical square blocks make progress even slower. There's um, beauty in the shape of the brick, which comes from a supreme economy. Some of the early bricks would, would typically be square, but square brick isn't terribly efficient. London looks to a different shape of brick, rectangular. Able to fit in a human hand, these rectangular blocks permit masons to raise structures quickly and efficiently. This shape also brings an added benefit, strength. The rectangular shape allows one brick to lay directly across two bricks below it that are facing in another direction. This stacking system gives walls strong patterns that distribute weight over a larger area, increasing both compressive and lateral strength. From churches to hospitals to private homes, brick restores London to a great world capital. Almost 200 years later, England calls on brick to take on an even greater challenge, uniting the nation. In the 1800s, the arrival of the steam engine changes the world. Engineers in England imagine a country tied together by a network of tracks. But there's a problem. Train tracks must be laid on a relatively flat surface. The English countryside is filled with hills and valleys. The solution, construct bridges or viaducts for the trains to travel on. But the English countryside is 50,000 square miles. It will ultimately need 20,000 miles of track and more than 30 viaducts, some of them miles long, to tie it together. Often unable to transport iron, in some remote locations, brick is the best answer. But can brick support the thousands of pounds of pressure it will encounter with each train? 
the viaduct saw bricks being used in a way that they'd not been used previously. And with the railways, of course, a huge consumer of bricks and viaducts themselves, massive engineering projects. Brick creates the foundation for viaducts and bridges across England. One of the greatest engineering achievements of the British rail system still stands, the Digswell Viaduct. It reaches heights of nearly 100 feet. It stretches almost a third of a mile, and more than 150 years after its completion, it still supports more than 200 trains every day. The simple strength behind the Digswell Viaduct, 13 million bricks. England, mid-1840s. Renowned engineer William Cubitt sets out to run a rail line from London north to Edinburgh. In the way is an enormous obstacle, the Mimram Valley. Cubitt looks to an engineering masterpiece for inspiration. He elects to use 40 massive arches modeled directly after the Roman aqueducts to span the distance. The strength of the arches will permit the viaduct to carry great weight with fewer bricks for construction. After just two years of construction, the viaduct opens in 1850. It quickly begins to buckle under the train traffic. As the use of brick developed and major cities wanted to use it for projects like viaducts and bridges, they discovered that brick has its weaknesses. They don't like to be shaked around. They don't like to be moved. They don't like vibrations so much. In essence, each train is like a mini earthquake, slowly shaking the bricks side to side, causing them to crack. Engineers need a new solution. The answer lies in a completely different kind of brick. Engineering, or pressed brick. All bricks have tiny pores or air pockets that can act as weak spots when they encounter force. Engineering brick is made by mechanically pressing the clay to be less porous, increasing strength. Well, engineering bricks came about largely because of the railways, where there was a need for a brick with compressive strength. In 1930, Engineering brick is used to reface the entire viaduct. More than 150 years after it's first erected, Digswell continues to provide safe passage between London and Edinburgh. Brick changes the very face of England. It brings a city back from the ashes and ties an entire nation together. But a new building material will expose the weakness of this trusted block a weakness that threatens to make it a relic of history. It stretches half a city block. It stands nearly 200 feet tall and is composed of almost 600,000 bricks. The Monadnock building in Chicago is a landmark in American architecture. When it opens in 1892, the Monadnock is hailed as a marvel of engineering. Today, it represents something very special in the history of brick, its downfall. The Monadnock is the last all-brick high-rise in the world. In the mid-1800s, a new invention is revolutionizing the world, the elevator. People can now travel up and down with great ease. Architects start to think in a new way, vertically. Chicago embraces the trend. Recovering from a devastating fire in 1871, much of the city is rebuilt in fireproof brick. Brick's ability to carry heavy loads also makes it a logical choice to erect the high-rise. If you can stack a brick over a thousand feet high before you'd ever crush it, brick compressive strength, and this is how much pressure it will take to actually push the brick down, is somewhere in the range of around 11,000 pounds per square inch, which is very high. 1889. Architects Daniel Burnham and John Wellborn Root plan to build the tallest brick office building on the planet. The Monadnock will stretch 16 stories above the heart of Chicago. 
To erect a building to such heights, engineers need to conquer a crucial problem. 